Well, good morning. It is so good to see each and every one of you. I just wanted to, to briefly talk about the video that we just watched. This morning kicks off our week of prayer for the Annie Armstrong uh, missions giving. Our um, missions committee has um, asked us to set a goal of $9,500, and our church is so good each year. We, we almost always meet our goal. And, uh, and so don't get it confused with the Lottie Moon. We take up a Lottie Moon offering each Christmas. That goes to our, our international missionaries. This goes to our, our missionaries here across America. And you may say, why are we sending so much money? Why does our, our, our convention send so much money there? Well, we live in the Bible Belt. We live where there are literally churches a mile apart, sometimes not even a mile apart. And, and we, we don't quite grasp that. Well, there was a preacher at the men's conference we went to uh, just this weekend at Faith Baptist. He was uh, Bob Pittman. He is Bob Pittman's son. Bob Pittman will be at our church in about a little over a month to preach our revival services. His name is Vance, and he is a pastor in Las Vegas. All right, some of you have been to Las Vegas. You know what I'm talking about. Um, and so he is, he is a pastor of a church in Las Vegas that, that is running over 2,500. That is a mega church. Anything over 2,000 is a mega church. And he said... Um, if Las Vegas next Sunday were to start 1,000 brand new churches and you took 500 lost people and put them in every one of those churches, how many people is that? That's 500,000 people. If you put 500,000 lost people in those brand new churches next Sunday, still almost 70% of Las Vegas would be lost. It, it's, it's almost hard to fathom. And I, had, I actually stopped listening to the sermon because I had to do those numbers. It was so hard to believe. And he's exactly right. He's exactly right. You see, here, here in the South, we have so many churches and so many different views. We, we disagree just you know, about King James Version or NIV or the new King James Version. Where's Michael? Um, and we have all kinds of disagreements. He said in Las Vegas... If I, he said, if I find a pastor or a church that just believes that the Bible is God's word, he said, there's not enough of us to, to not partner up. We have to team up because there's not very many. And so this is so, such an important part of what we do. And, and they're asking Southern Baptist churches across the denomination, across, across America, to, to come together and support this so that we can reach more people for Jesus Christ. Because, guys, that's really what it's all about. That's the only thing that it's about, is to make the name of Jesus known. So we would ask that you prayerfully consider today and over this next week of how you could sacrificially give to help our church reach the goal of $9,500 so that we can help support those missionaries. Which, by the way, your very own pastor, my pastor, he was the recipient of, of these, these uh, funds uh, when he was in New York. And so, um, so we're at, very close to the heart, right, Pastor? Well, we're going to get on with our service. I wanted to say welcome to everybody, particularly our visitors this morning. Uh, it's so good to have you come out. I know the rain messed up my hair, but you all look wonderful. Um, and so uh, we wanted to ask you if you are a, a visitor, whether you're a first-time visitor or you're still trying to figure out this First Baptist Church you know, thing, um, t we tear out this insert. Uh, Mark some prayer requests or mark down, hey, I have some questions. I just need to figure out why is Cliff still on staff or why does Jeremy always wear coat and ties, I, you know, whatever. Uh, if you have questions about discipleship classes or the youth ministry or the children's ministry, this is a great way to find that information out. Wonderful way. You get, they will come directly to us. We'll, we'll work it out through, uh, as a staff uh, and members you know as well. You have prayer requests. Just write that down. It's very private. It'll come to us, and we'll, we'll, we'll love to pray for you. We take joy in praying for you as a staff. Well, with all that, I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to get this service uh, going. How about that? Father God, I love you. Thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for the awesome Sunday school lesson um, and Sunday school time that we had this morning. Well, this is a special time. You have been so good to First Baptist Church Covington. We want to continue to be obedient to your calling. We want to, we want to worship you. We want to honor you. We want to praise you through song, through the preaching of your word this morning. And I think really what's awesome, Lord, is as we worship you, we also receive the blessing of just feeling awesome and feeling good and just feeling ministered to. 
Lord, I pray right now that the Holy Spirit will just come in and just work in our hearts. That the Holy Spirit will draw us closer to you. It says in James, as we draw near to you, God, you draw near to us. We want to fill you this morning. May the worship that comes from this room be very pleasing to you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everybody said? Amen.
Christ this morning, it is well with your soul. Don't let anybody tell you any differently. It is well with your soul. Let's sing together. When peace like a river I see. 
heart, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh, my soul, it is well with my soul. praise for who you are, Lord. Lord, just uh, thank you for uh, allowing us to be here today to worship you. Truly, we're just singing praises to you, and, and that's what we, we're supposed to do, reflect it back to you, because you're great, awesome, and merciful. Lord, just uh, make us a desperate people, Lord. Make me a desperate person to seek your will, to seek you. Lord, we just, uh, just uh, there's no words can express the gratitude and the love that you've shown for us. If we could just, just give us a piece of that back to you, Lord. We just thank you for allowing us to be here, Lord. Just lift up these tithes and these offers that they do serve you and serve your kingdom, Lord, and be used to, in a mighty way. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you, musicians, choirs, singers, everybody. I think it would be safe to say, folks, we've had church this morning. Amen. 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 Thank you. The Lord has been with us. May he continue to be with us as we continue in the word of God. Let's open our Bibles, your Bibles, 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 Bibles. Remember Bibles? You got your Bibles today? Open them to Colossians, the third chapter. Colossians, the third chapter, we're going to continue with the series of messages on the supremacy of Christ. We'll be talking about peace. It's more than a possibility. The Lord brings his peace to us. Maybe on a day like today, you said, oh my goodness, it's been so cold. And now it's raining outside on Sunday morning. Maybe you woke up with the three G's. You know what the three G's are? Grumpy, gripey, and grouchy. You might be one of those people who said, if they want to know what we should do in the Mideast, I'd say nuke them. You know, maybe you've got that kind of an attitude, right? Uh, this morning when it's like, oh, it's that kind of a day. When you get into that kind of deal and that kind of feeling, you don't have that peace in your heart. You may say, no, pastor, I don't have the peace of God in my heart. Well, today, there's hope. I want to tell you, peace is more than just a possibility. It is a promise that is as solid as the Lord Jesus himself. So let's look at it today. See what the Lord has to say to us. Colossians, the third chapter. Let's start at verse 15. And it says, let the peace of the Messiah. Uh, the word peace in the Old Testament means, it is the word shalom. You've heard that before. And shalom means to be completed, to be balanced. Uh, when your life is completed and balanced, don't you feel more peaceful, all right? So he talks about shalom in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it is the name, I mean, it is the word Irene, uh, which we get our name, Irene. Do we have anybody here named Irene? All right. Oh, okay. I'm kind of surprised. Okay. If you have a relative or a friend named Irene, their name means peace. So, and in the original language, it means to bring two people together in unity. So, he says, let the Irene, let the shalom of the Messiah, the completeness of him, uh, come and rest upon you, he says, to which you have been called according to one body, let it control. Now, in the, uh, there's another translation that says rule. The King James, it says rule. I like that word rule because it has the idea behind it of umpire. Have you ever been to a ball game and it seemed like the referee or the umpires just were not in control of the game? And you said, man, this thing's getting out of hand. Well, he says, let the peace of Christ just come out and umpire your life, referee your life. Or it's also used of a judge. Maybe when the uh, uh, prosecutor or the uh, defense attorney says, objection, your honor, and the judge will say, objection overruled. We're going to keep this thing under control. So he says, let that peace just rule and be in charge of your life all right so he says let it be there and be thankful let the message about the messiah dwell richly among you teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom and singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to god whatever you do in word or deed do everything in the name of the lord jesus giving thanks to god the father through him. So he speaks about peace and how it's more than a possibility. It is a promise. It's right there available to every child of God. Let's look first of all at how his peace can overcome our fears. There are three what I call deal breakers when it comes to peace. And unless those are dealt with, there's not going to be peace in the heart. The first one is this, that God has promised to give us peace with him, peace with God. And this has to do with our eternal life. That which the Lord gives is peace for eternity. If you'll notice on the screen here, look what it says. And in your Bible in Romans 5.1, it says, Therefore, we have been declared righteous by faith. Because of that, as believers in Christ, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, it's right there. If you are a child of God, you're not at war with Him anymore. He has given you His eternal peace. That means this. That your salvation is for all of eternity. That means that you can rest assured 
that when you lay your head down at night, I lay me down to sleep. You don't have to pray the Lord your soul to keep, and if you should die. Isn't that the most dreadful thing to tell a child? If you should die before you wake, you better hope the Lord your soul will take. I've always kind of trembled at that. But anyway, when you lay your head down to sleep at night, you can be assured of the fact that you know Christ is Savior, that heaven is your home. But can you imagine what it's like? There are some people here right now, there are some people here right now that don't know that peace because you don't know where you're going to spend eternity. It could be heaven. It could be hell. You're not sure. Listen, the Lord says you don't have to live in that kind of discord and that kind of anxiety. You could have his perfect peace about your eternity. If you have come to know Christ as Savior, then you are eternally secure in him, and he is yours, and you are his for all of eternity. We have peace with God. That's eternal peace. The second thing that we see is peace in the midst of pain. Peace in the midst of pain, and that is the internal peace that he gives. Now, if you'll notice what it says in verse 15. Let the peace of the Messiah, to which you've been called, control your heart. His peace is already there. You don't have to go out and grab it. You don't have to go out and look for it. It's already there. He says, just let it come out. But this is the internal peace that he gives in the midst of pain. Some of you are facing some very painful situations right now. I mean, you've got family issues that are going on that are really hard to deal with. Others of you have heartache in the way of what the future is going to hold for your job situation. Others of you are like, I don't know what I'm going to do with the message that I've been given about the health of a loved one. And on and on we could list about how that there are issues in life that are bringing discord and heartache How am I going to have peace with the Lord? Look what it says in John 16, verse 33. I have told you these things so that in me, notice where it is, in me, you may have peace. That's where it all resides. You will have suffering (coughs) in this world. (coughs) Be courageous. I have overcome the world. All of you are feeling scratchy throat right now, aren't you? (laughs) Sorry. Uh, So there is the internal peace that he gives in the midst of pain. The third thing that we see is peace with others. Notice what he says, Paul says, If it is possible on your part, live at peace with everyone. Do whatever you can. Make that phone call and step forward and you be the strong one and make the apology. You be the one to take the first step. Do whatever you can to live in peace with all. Well, when they apologize, I will. When they forgive, I will. On and on. No, he says, do your part. But there are situations and times when we cannot do any more. The Muslim terrorists came to visit us. We would say, can we have peace? And he would say, yes, we can have peace when you submit to Allah. And we say, I can't do that. We say, okay, off with your head. Can't have peace there, can we? So there are times when there is no peace. That's why Paul said, if possible, if it can be done on your part, live in peace with everyone. So that is that external peace that he talks about. These are the greatest needs when it comes to peace. Now let's look at some misconceptions about peace. Misconceptions. Some people think of it as appeasement I call appeasement a pleasement I'm trying to please everybody people in that category are caught up with OPO you know what OPO is other people's opinion I'm so worried about what other people are talking and thinking about me so I'm going to do everything I can to please them that won't work in the 1930s Hitler was marching across Europe and as he was one, as he was going across Europe, one country after another was falling. The British and the French were saying, we're next, we've got to do something. So the ambassador from England met with Hitler and he made a deal with the devil. He said, if we do this, will you please you know, stop making war? And of course, Hitler said, sure, you could. Yeah, absolutely. I promise I'll be a nice guy. 
they tried to appease him. And so they came back and said, Neville Chamberlain said, look, we have, we have peace. We have appeased him. And it, in no time, war started back. And by the time it was over with, 20 million people had died. And it all started with appeasement. Now today we have the same thing going on. People are being slaughtered in the Mideast. Christians are dying on a daily basis, and it seems as if our leadership is trying to work in the area of appeasement. It won't work. You cannot become a doormat and say whatever you want. That is a misconception about peace. It's not doing and trying to please everybody. It's also not the absence of conflict. People say, well, if we can just, you know, not have any more problems, we can just, everybody be nice, then that's not going to work. As I said earlier, a lot of people are caught up with other people's opinions, and so they try and, whoever they're with, they're, they try and be with them and go along with them so that no waves are made. And it's kind of like a, a chameleon. All of you know what a chameleon is? A chameleon is a, um, it's this lizard-like creature that, um, it's this lizard-like creature that changes color. If we were to put a chameleon on this pulpit, it would turn brown. If I were to put a chameleon on this green plant here, it would turn green. If we were to put a chameleon on my pink tie, it would turn pink. I've seen videos of what a chameleon can do. It's amazing what it can do. Did you hear about the chameleon that fell on a plaid sport coat? It just exploded everywhere. I mean, it was really ugly. I mean, it's really bad. Do you ever feel like that when you're trying to please everybody? Oh, and do you just feel like internally, I'm just going to explode because nobody's happy while I'm trying to make everybody happy. That's a real misconception about peace. So what is the pathway? Okay, let's look at verses 5 through 10. Put off the grave clothes. Some of you may say, well, Brother Chuck, this is the third time, third sermon in a row that you've talked about grave clothes. That's right. Third time, I hope, is charm. You've got to put off the grave clothes. That's where it all begins. You can't have peace if you're wearing the grave clothes. Look at what they are in verse 5. Put to death whatever is worldly, immorality, impurity, evil desire, greed, idolatry. And then he goes on, he talks about anger and wrath and malice and slander and filthy language. He says, put it all off. You can't have peace if you're wearing the grave clothes. Here's how it works. You're trying to mix things together that just won't work. Imagine what it would be like if you were to have, take your car and you would say, you know, I'm so tired of paying $2.20 a gallon for gasoline. I'm going to start putting diesel. I'd rather pay $2.90 uh, for fuel. And uh, so you go up and you say, I'm going to put diesel in my car. And you do. You say, it's, it's a petroleum product. I think it's going to be better anyway. And so, you, you know, you say, I, I, I think I can try this. You do. You go a few miles down the road. The car quits. Won't work. Let's say you're going to bake a cake. And I got this wrong in the first service, and I didn't try and fix it in the second service, and I hope I don't mess it up again. But here we go. If, you, if you're trying to bake a cake, and you two cups of flour maybe, you may say, bake a cake and get flour. You get it, a cake comes in a box. That's where you go and bake a, start with the baking. But if you don't have a box, okay, instant. A couple of cups of flour, some baking soda, powder, baking powder. <laughs> and uh, two cups of flour and how much baking powder? Two teaspoons of baking powder. And some milk and eggs and all that. And you say, you know what? I, I, I don't want to do the baking powder and flour. Let's just reverse it. Let's take two cups of baking powder and two teaspoons of flour. They're both white. <laughs> Ought to work. Ought to work. What are you going to get? You're going to get bad is what you're going to get. It's not going to work. But I have good intentions. Here's what people do. They have good intentions. They say, oh, I just want God's peace in my life. And sometimes I'm a terrible counselor and I have to hold my tongue. And they'll say, I don't understand why my life is so messed up. And I want to say, because you're so stupid. Why your life so messed up? You're so stupid. 
But I go, oh, well, maybe you've been going in the wrong direction. That's the pastoral way of saying it. You've got this greed, you've got this immorality, you've got this filthy language, you've got this anger, anger, all of this grave, stinking stuff. And where is the peace? You see, people want the peace and they want the grave clothes. That's like trying to mix diesel and gas, like reversing the ingredients in a cake. It, don't, it ain't going to happen. It will not be there. Look at verse 5 again. I mean, verse 15 again. Let the peace... Let it come out. It's there. But the grave clothes cover it up. It suppresses it. Then he says, put on the grace clothes. Just take off the grave clothes. Put on the grace clothes. The righteousness that he speaks about and all of the good stuff that he talks about, the new man he talks about, all of that compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, forgiveness, all of that, put that on and see what God does. When you put that on, here's, you take off the grave clothes, you put on the grace clothes, it's automatic that the peace comes out. Have you, ever, have you ever had a time of prayer where you've gotten truly before the Lord and I mean you've said, God, take off these grave clothes and you've had just a good bath of repentance and you get up and what do you say? Man, I feel better. feels good. That's that peace coming out and coming through. Then the next thing that he says is, be filled with the word and gratitude to take the word of God, put it in your heart, make it more than just a book, make it your life message, to take the word and, he says, have a life of gratitude. You see, there are three, G, three G's that I talked about, the grumpy, the grouchy, and the grumbling. But there's another one that will counteract those first three. And that's called gratitude. If I have a heart of gratitude, I say, I am so grateful for the things that I have. I have had so much taken from me, but there's some that is left. For that which is left, I'm grateful. I don't have much in life, but the little that I have, I am grateful. I, I have not achieved what I wanted to achieve, but I am still alive, and I have an other opportunity to do more by the grace of God. For that, I am grateful. Gratitude is one of the greatest pathways to God's peace. As we say, Lord, thank you. Living in a life of gratitude. And if you'll notice, a part of it also, if you'll go back to verse 16, it talks about the Word. It talks about spiritual songs. Also, you need to have good Christian music going. Like the kind of music that we have here in this church, if that doesn't charge your battery, your heart is as hard as a cast iron skillet. It is as cold as ice from the North Pole, if your heart has not been lifted today, oh, my friends, from the spiritual singing, he says, the hymns, the psalms, the spiritual songs, all of that ought to open your heart to the Lord's peace that he wants to bestow upon you. And then the last thing that he says is this, do everything in the name of Christ. Let Jesus just be the controlling point. Let him be the... The, the focus, let him be the one that is the center of your life. In Jesus' name, he's the word on your tongue. He's the thought in your mind. He's the close one in your heart. Just let him be there. Recently, I read a story about a woman who was a church pianist in a church in California. And there was a guest preacher who spoke about trials and tribulations and he said, when you face sorrows and trials, just say, for this I have Jesus. And he said that several times in the message. Several times. For this I have Jesus. That made a real impact upon her. For this I have Jesus. And she could not know that she was going to need that immediately after the service. Because when the service was over with and she had finished playing, at the piano she checked her cell phone and there was a missed call from her family in Philadelphia and they said come quickly mom has suffered a severe stroke well not only then did she have great sorrow in her heart but knowing that she needed to get there quickly she realized she also had a deep fear of flying and so she said I remember the promise for this I have Jesus 
for this I have Jesus. So she summoned up her courage, stood on the promise of the Lord Jesus, booked a flight, got on the plane and said, for this I have Jesus. Flew across the United States to Philadelphia. When she got off the plane, she was met by the family and they said, it's too late. Mom has already passed away. And she said, for this I have Jesus. Jesus. Everybody expected her to fall apart, but she held it together because the peace that passes understanding. So, she wrote, after it was over with, she wrote and sent an email to that guest preacher and she said, you don't know the difference that was made in my life because I never could have faced what I faced and had God's peace had it not been for the understanding that whatever I face I can say, for this I have Jesus. You know, that message is for someone or several someones here today. Some of you know it. You need it right now. Some of you don't know that that when you leave this service, you may be facing, you may be facing a sorrow or a tragedy or just a trial that is beyond your comprehension. I want to remind you, for this you have Jesus. And if you'll state that, and stand upon it, the peace of Christ will come flooding into your heart. Now here's what we're going to do, okay? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a peace convention here at the altar, down front. Because some of you are are facing some real needs spiritually when it comes to peace. And what I'm going to do is invite you to come and stand here. We're just going to have a real simple prayer, a real challenge and a prayer. Others of you have friends, loved ones, family members, that their life is chaos. And you want to come and stand in intercession for them because they have no peace in their life because of the grave clothes that they're wearing. And you're going to come and stand and pray for them. Now what we're going to do is we're just going to gather here around the front and I'm going to have a prayer for you. And you can just begin to stand upon the fact that His peace is there, lo, I am with you always. All right, so let's just bow our head right now, okay? With our heads bowed, this is the time of the invitation for you to come. So if you would come now and stand with me about God's peace, amen? All right, others, amen? If you feel the Holy Spirit leading you, as you're coming, I tell you what, let's just go ahead and We'll join hands down here at the front. Now, when you join hands, what you're doing is you're making a connection. You're making a connection that God is going to use to help that person you're holding hands with to go to other people. Nothing magical about it, but there is something spiritual about it. I'd like to ask also if there could be a couple of folks that are spiritually minded in our church, if they could come and just pray with people right now, all right? Amen. Maybe you want to put your hand on a... If you're close to some folks down here at the front and you feel the Lord lean, put a hand on a shoulder to pray with right now, go ahead and do that. All right, let's, let's help each other right now. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about your great trial that you're facing right now. Or the great need in a friend, family, neighbor, whoever. I want you to see it, think it, remember it right now. All right, you've got it. Maybe it hurts. Maybe it brings anxiety. And right now, what I want you to do is just say this. For this I have Jesus. You know that the enemy is trying to do what he can to rob, either from your life or loved one's life. Say in your heart, for this I have Jesus. Now, in order to really put this deep in your soul, I want you to say it out loud with me in just a moment. Because the enemy is doing all that he can to fight against standing with the Lord Jesus Say it out loud with me right now. For this, I have Jesus. Say it again. For this, I have Jesus. Now say it loudly 
For this I have Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are greater than any storm, that uh, any suffering that, or any tragedy. Lord, thank you that you are greater than any heartache. And I thank you, Lord, you've not abandoned. Lord, we cry out today. Lord, for this we have you. For this I have Jesus. So, Lord, I pray that that peace would come upon hearts that are broken. I pray that that help would come to those who feel so weak. I pray for those who, who see no hope for a loved one. Oh, God, I pray that you would bring help and strength and understanding. Lord, may the enemy have his last victory in some hearts here. The last defeat. May your strength be given in a mighty way. We love you, Lord Jesus. And folks, let's just say it one more time. For this I have Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You can return to your seat right now. As, as you return into your seat and as we continue with this time of invitation, there are those who need to make some decisions. There's not going to be real peace until you give your heart to Jesus, okay? You can't put that off and expect things are going to be okay. So today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to give your heart to Christ. You need to make an appointment about baptism. You put that off long enough. The end of May, we're going to be baptizing. We baptize every Sunday if the need is here. But we're ready for you to let that be known. And you're always going to have something that's just kind of a little uncertain if you're not really plugged into a church. So it's not going to be peaceful until you really get with God's people and see what His strength is through them. So we're going to sing here in just a moment. As God speaks to your heart, would you come? Let's stand and sing this invitation time with her.